Don't let application security risks be a ticking time bomb. Get started today with a free trial at microfocus.com slash FOD. Find, fix, fortify. Masha Sadova is an award-winning people security expert, speaker, and trainer focused on engaging people to be key elements of secure organizations. She is the co-founder of Elevate Security, the first people-centric security platform that leverages behavioral science. Masha's talk is entitled, Blinded by the Weakest Link, A New Perspective on Human Risk. Humans have always been central to actual security. As anyone who has school-aged children knows, internet filters prove that tools don't always deter human problems. I look forward to hearing more about a holistic approach to security and trust programs. Please welcome Masha Sadova. Hi and welcome. I'm Masha Sadova and today I'm so excited to be talking to you about a new perspective on human risk and how we in security have been blinded by the weakest link. Before we get started, I would like to just tell you a little bit about how I got here today and I'm so excited to be talking to you about this particular subject. So I've been in the security uh, space for over 16 years, started my career initially uh, working for the DOD um, and focusing on Russian APTs. And in that capacity, I became really fascinated with the human element and came to believe that security was people attacking people with a whole bunch of technology in the middle. That love and interest and passion took me to Salesforce, where I got to start and run a team uh, focused on the full spectrum of the human element and human risk. And for five years, got to help people tackle things like phishing and tailgating all the way through secure coding practices and security feature adoption. Ultimately, my love of the human factor in security took me to starting my own company, Elevate Security which I'm the co-founder of, and today Elevate Security is the leading platform that helps companies uh, measure and influence human risk in their organization. Uh, throughout my career, I have been really focused on the question of how do we get people to want to do security instead of just have to? And that question has took me to the field of behavioral science and positive psychology, all of which I've been working into uh, my work as a security practitioner and helping uh, organizations across the world start thinking about human risk in a totally different light. And so with that, I wanted to start by uh, sharing one of the realizations I've come, throughout my career, come to throughout my career. And that is that human risk is one of the largest unsolved problems in security. It's also one of the largest unexplored areas in security. And the reason that I believe this is because if you open up the Verizon Data Breach Report this year, you'll see that the top reasons for attacks and successful incidents in this last year uh, are those that you see in front of you. Now, if I were to ask you if any of these came as a surprise, you'd likely tell me no, because these are the same reasons attackers have been getting into our organizations for at least a decade. And so as thoughtful security practitioners, we've invested in all of these technologies that help us mitigate and detect and, and uh, respond from uh, these type of vulnerabilities, and yet they are still the ones we're tackling year after year. And why is that? It's because there is a human component that we have failed to address in every one of these attack vectors. The human element or human risk uh, is the soft underbelly of security. And without looking into it closely and thoughtfully, it will continue to thwart us in our efforts to defend our organizations. Now, the reason this, ex uh, uh, this weakness exists could be one option in that employees our users are dumb. They're the weakest link and they're always going to make mistakes. And frankly, this is the uh, approach that we have been thinking of about the end user for quite a long time. In fact, we don't even call them employees or the workforce. We call them, again, end users and uh, have 
not been attributing very kind thoughts around them. Things calling them things like wetware or the problem exists between the keyboard and the chair or the weakest link. And so it's been really comfortable for us to say, oh, well, employees are just the weakest link in the system. They're dumb. They're always going to be dumb. Let's just throw technology at this problem. There's a different approach and a different philosophy, and that is that it is not the employee's fault, but it is our inability as security practitioners to meet them where they are at. And instead of using the weakest link as an excuse for the standard status quo, it should in fact be a rallying cry for us to meet this very challenging problem head on and with the resources it deserves because the, our inability to do that is going to continue to thwart our ability to effectively secure our organizations. Now we have spent a lot of resources evolving our security tech stacks and over over decades we have done an amazing job at evolving our technologies and helping uh, our organizations evolve but the human operating system has had very little progress from what we were doing back in 2002 to what we're doing today. In fact, if I were to again ask you to raise your hand if you've ever gone through an annual security training in your company that you have muted, skipped to the end, and guessed the quiz question, I would guess a hundred percent of everyone listening and watching this right now would raise their hand. This is the same approach we have done year after year and hoping that we are going to somehow solve this problem in our organizations. This particular approach of using the uh, annual security training is really driven by a compliance mandate. It's done as one size fits all and its impact is very hard to measure. Arguably, there's very little impact to measure. And so if we continue to use this approach time and time again, we're going to uh, reinforce what Albert Einstein used as a definition of insanity, which is uh, expecting a different result from the same old approach. And so what I would like to do uh, in this talk is explain and walk you through that how human risk is a critical and foundational piece of security that has not had the attention it deserves to date and show you how it affects every aspect of security no matter what role you hold in today. I'd like to uh, explain to you how you as a security practitioner are a stakeholder in this conversation and provide an alternative framework that can help you understand how to measure and influence human risk in whatever organizations you work for today. So let's get started. I've used this term a couple of times, uh, human risk. So what do I mean by that? What, what, does, uh, what do these two, two words uh, stand for? So first and foremost, let's talk about what it is not. So you may work for an organization that uh, already has security practitioners uh, working security awareness practitioners and those folks are responsible for potentially rolling out training but security awareness is not the same thing as understanding human risk and let me explain why uh, the difference uh, the thing that security awareness focuses on is knowledge it focuses on the idea that if our if we just tell our employees that uh, about more information around security and security best practices, they're going to change their behaviors. And that, in fact, is not what we have seen time and time again. LastPass did a great study of their um, users and found that despite a huge portion of their population knowing what good security practices look like, many of them continue to exhibit poor password habits. Similarly, if any of us knew about uh, if, if knowledge was enough, all of, all of the smokers in the world would heed the smoking kills package, uh, awareness on the cigarette uh, packages and not smoke. 
But what we understand is that awareness is not the same thing as action. And what people do is so much more important than what people know. And if any of us have worked for organizations with very independent-minded employees, and I would argue this exists in almost every organization, we find that the best laid policies and the best laid um, advice will always be circumvented by the actions our employees think that they should be taking. And so, again, measuring how much our employees know and their quiz questions and how committed they are to security isn't enough. Human risk is, is the study of going beyond that and understanding what our employees actually do. Now, human risk isn't just bad behaviors and the introduction of negative actions. It is the combination and an understanding of all of the decisions that employees make on our, in our environments, both good and bad, the combination of which that I, can either reduce our exposure to incidents or help um, uh, accelerate it. Now, you might be thinking, well, we already measure human risk as it relates to phishing. We have an understanding of how well people are related to uh, people are in detecting phishing compromise rates. But there are so many other factors that go into the security decisions our employees make on the networks and of our environments and on, with our technologies and our source code. And uh, this wheel is just a sampling of what many of the factors that, on a daily basis, our workforces are asked to think about and make decisions on as uh, related to security. And every one of these points is an area where an employee can make a good dis security decision or a poor security decision, all of which are helping uh, uh, our security posture or hurting it. As you can see, some of these are preventative and in choosing to do so can help my uh, organization uh, be more secure so I can apply my patching and my machine faster. I can turn on to a FA proactively. I can use password managers. I can be thoughtful about how I should handle my data. I can also be much better at detecting when things come at me like malware and phishing, tailgating incidents, or if I'm navigating to a site that looks suspicious, all of which can help understand uh, help help the security team understand if I am uh, a good or bad uh, minded uh, security individual. So I wanted to sh uh, share this in a story to paint this picture a little bit more clearly. Uh, and I want to tell you the story about Clara. So Clara is a developer and she needs to, uh, she's working on a piece of code that's getting shipped. Uh, and she has 10 days worth of work to do that includes security reviews, but she only has seven days in her, uh, in, in a work day, in, in her allotted work time to be able to ship this code on time. So what is she going to do? Is she going to ship this code on time, but without the security testing? Or is she going to ship it late and securely? Now, in this case, security is an opposing force to all of the other business pressure, pressures that are uh, pushing down on her. Whether or not uh, she's gonna meet her deadline, how her boss is going to um, uh, either reprimand or support her, uh, how her bonus is affected based on all these decisions. But in this moment, Clara has the opportunity to make a security decision of whether or not she's going to thoroughly test her code for security. And if she works for an organization that supports good security decision making and, and is thoughtful about reducing human risk, she will choose a decision that will be pro-secured uh, and will push, push the code later, uh, later but securely. But let's say she works for an organization where um, the deadline and the bonus is tied to timely releases. What will end up happening? Maybe nothing at all. Maybe she ships this code and no breaches or incidents happen and maybe nobody finds this particular vulnerability and life goes on. But what's happened is that in this situation, 
Claire has introduced just a small amount of security debt in her organization. And that security debt, as you can see on the screen as the um, yellow triangle, starts building over time. In all of the organization, with all of the Claire's happening, every time a decision like this is made, then we are adding towards the security failure up until the point the security debt of the organization is so great that it results in a breach. So by no means does any one risky decision at one point lead to a headline, but it is the aggregate of the debt and the aggregate of these decisions that increase the probability towards security failure. Now, the example of Clara is not the only place that security risk and the human risk exists for organization. In fact, it touches every element of the modern cybersecurity tech stack. No matter what part of security you work in, there is a human being who is responsible for making thoughtful security decisions associated with the security protocols that we set out. If I am, I have access to infrastructure um, as code and I'm setting up settings, I need to make thoughtful decisions about permissioning. If I am adjusting firewall rules and am in charge and have some amount of change management that I'm responsible for, what kind of approvals and threat modeling have I done uh, for these types of uh, whitelisting of, of accounts, for example? And so these decisions touch our code, our infrastructure, uh, our tech stacks on an ongoing basis and regularly. So the debt that we think about gets added on to every one of these categories um, and eventually build up over time. And so it doesn't really matter what part of security you're in because human risk introduces these vulnerabilities when they are ignored uh, and, and decided poorly. And so we can see that if you're in infra and engineering, AWS buckets uh, uh, get leaked quite, quite frequently uh, uh, these days. Product security coding errors and code gets that's unsh untested gets shipped. Access management with stolen credentials. Uh, if you're in charge of privacy and access control to, to sensitive data handling and, and careless decision-making by employees, unpatched vulnerabilities if you, are work, if you work in enterprise security, and if you're in incident response, then you're cleaning up all of these decisions, all of these mistakes and pain points that have inter been introduced in your organization. Now, when it goes well, it looks totally different. And I don't have headlines for you to show you what it looks like when it goes well because this never makes the news. A well-run, secure organization is not going to be the next headline of Wall Street Journal. But what it looks like is that when you have human risk as part of your integrated strategy in your security team, for incident response, the metrics you're held accountable to, like the number of incidents, will start going down because there's less uh, less vulnerabilities to clean up, less mistakes happening, and your time to close starts improving. If you're in compliance, your audit findings reduce, and as people are, are leaning more into um, following compliance rules. If you're in enterprise security, uh, it's, it's thoughtful adoption of pat patching metrics or VPN usage or even the use of um, MFA across your organization. If you're in product security, the number of bugs you find in code, how fast those bugs are fixed, and how frequently you have releases that are secure on the first round. And if you're in, in, on a red team, your life actually becomes harder. And that's great because the, you're going to find that more people um, are resilient to attacks, reporting more, and uh, are, are introducing less vulnerabilities into their organization. And on a final note on this particular section, the, the addressing human risk in our organization is not a silver bullet, but it is a key layer of defense. And what, what you see right now on the screen is my favorite model of risk, which is Swiss cheese. 
and really anything related to cheese is delightful, but in the Swiss cheese model of risk, we see that everything is a layer that helps defend our organizations in some, but no one layer is perfect. So that when a hazard gets through one layer, like an engineer control, there are subsequent layers that can help catch us. And so behavioral controls, which is what we've been talking about, the hu human risk and the decisions our employees make in an organization, are a key factor that help reinforce the other elements that we have in our organization. Both the engineering controls, the process controls we have in place that should all work together to help make our organizations more secure. By choosing to just think about behavioral controls as a compliance exercise where we check the box, we fail to add a full layer of defense in our organizations in the way and help defend them in the way that they really can be defended. So hopefully uh, we're, all, we're all on board on the idea that each one of our jobs in security, no matter what role you have, is directly impacted uh, by the, the human element and the type of decisions that our employees make in our organization. So how, now that we realize we're all stakeholders, how do we actually affect change? What is your role uh, in, in doing all of this? Well, first I'd like to acknowledge that the human element is not a programmable OS, uh, as we called it earlier, and it has many layers to it. And so we can't solve this problem from the same space as we solve most of our other security problems. Human beings are messy and dynamic and complex. And so the things that we need to be applying here are actually tools outside of security to help tackle this problem. Uh, in my uh, decade plus of looking at this problem space, I found that three particular areas of study have been really valuable in uh, addressing this risk. One is data analytics, which will help us measure this problem. And the last two are psychology and behavioral science, which can help us understand how and why employees are making these decisions that they are and how we can influence it. So I'm going to walk through um, in two sections uh, a couple of ideas and frameworks that might empower you to be able to gain visibility and influence this particular problem. So let's start with the first part of this question, which is how do we measure human risk? Measuring this isn't really important because we can't change what we can't see. So how do we understand the level of human risk in our organization and what do we need to do about it? So when we think about the, the security actions that, in, that our employees and our workforce take in our organization, it's because of two major categories of um, concepts. The first is everything above the iceberg, and these are the observable behaviors, the decisions that we choose to do. And then everything below the iceberg is what we believe, why we do the things we do. Now, we're going to walk through ways of measuring both of these at scale. Uh, and I want to walk you through specifically some examples. The first is observable behaviors. So what I mean by that is when an employee clicks on a phishing link or if they're reporting an attack or using a password manager, all of these are the things that have metrics associated and we can see if it is going up or down. Now, underneath it, the reason I would do one of these observable behaviors is because I have a belief that security is part of my job, that I am a target, or I am not a target, or I have valuable information to protect. If I don't believe that I have valuable information to protect, then I am much more likely to click on a phishing link. If I don't think I'm a target, then who cares if I use a password manager? Now, the reason I would hold these beliefs and values are because of assumptions that I've had in my life. Do I think a breach can happen to me? Do I think that security um, belongs in some other department and I may not be capable of, of tackling these kinds of uh, problem sets? And all of this is underneath the foundation of the experiences I've had in my life. 
And if I have ever been through a breach in my life, I am much more likely to believe that a breach can happen to me and I'm much more likely to believe that I am a target and security is part of my job and I am much more likely to be careful about clicking on phishing links, reporting attack, attacks, being thoughtful about how I handle my source code or being very careful about how I set up my uh, controls and permissions. Now, if I do not have, I've never experienced a breach or never been part of a red team where it ha has given me these types of data sets, everything built on top of that is, um, it is much more questionable. Uh, so that's why it's really important to measure the two, two of these. Um, the observable behaviors are actually where the risk gets introduced. It's where the rubber meets the road and where vulnerabilities happen or defense happens in our organization. But the bottom part is the why. So let's focus on the above the iceberg part first. So we all know in, that in our organization, there are some employees that make risky decisions sometimes, but there are also some employees that make really great decisions. Can we answer today effectively which employees are which, what decisions they're making, and how often? The reason we have one-size-fits-all security trainings today is because very rarely can organizations answer this very critical and fundamental question. We can do this, we can answer questions like this for our technology stacks. We can say which of our computers are patched. Uh, and we talk about asset management and understanding what's going on in your organization. We do not have the same rigor around our employee base. So let's talk about how we can answer this really core fundamental question. So the first thing that's important to, to realize is that past predictors are one of the best indicators, uh, the, one of the past actions are one of the best indicators of future actions. In fact, a study done in 2015 by Dr. Caputo um, called Going Spear Fishing showed that in three targeted spear phishing attacks that have happened, uh, that were sent to a population of 1,500 employees, the, uh, employees were likely to either click on all of them or none of them. And how you performed on the very first spear phishing attack that you uh, uh, received was a very high indicator of how you were going to react to the next sets of spear phishing attacks that you were going to get. So with that in mind, we can start realizing that there are decisions that employees are making in our environment all the time that can help us understand our level of exposure to this particular problem set. So I want to take the example of um, malware. So let's say we have two uh, employees in our organization, Sue and Joe, and they both receive malware um, that gets sent to them. Now Sue is more, is more security minded than Joe and she immediately recognizes that she should not be downloading and running executables from unknown senders. Good job, Sue. Uh, and doesn't click, doesn't execute, uh, deletes this. Now Joe really is intrigued by this executable. Seems like something he really wants to run. So he tries to download it. He tries. To, he downloads and tries to execute it. And uh, both Joe and Sue work for an organization that has uh, thoughtfully installed endpoint protection on their machines that detects that malware is trying to be run and stops the execution. Great. But usually this is the spot where we... Uh, even in our most uh, advanced states as security teams, stop. We think about the incident as having been prevented, and so the, the day is done. We're good. However, this particular uh, event, it gets logged and is pure gold in helping us understand which employee exhibits low malware risk and which employee exhibits high malware risk. Joe, in this case, is clearly not certified to judge what, what should or shouldn't be executed and therefore needs to have follow-up intervention and course correction here. It could be that he might need training, but it could be that he needs more advanced policies and controls or more dedicated, uh, dedicated technology to help him with malware. 
Now, endpoint protection is not the only technology that can give us insight into the risk in our organization. In fact, so many of our technologies that we have spent millions of dollars on help us map and understand the type of decisions our employees are making today. Um, and we can map things like sensitive data handling, password protection, internet browsing, it from, and um, device security all from the tech stack we have in place. So we, uh, as we, we revisit the wheel that we talked about earlier, we can see that every one of the segments of human risk that we think about actually ties to technology that can give us the insights that we need to understand intent. And just to close the loop on this, the technologies that we have in place can then help us understand which individuals are stronger and weaker and in what areas, giving us a really fine level of precision to understand how to course correct for this particular risk. Uh, as many of you who are, have been in security for a while uh, have are familiar with this, uh, the definition of risk is impact times likelihood of an event. And so if we extract that to human risk, similarly, we have these two components. And now likelihood is exactly what we just talked about. This user reputation of an employee, of how good or bad they are at understanding and detecting malware. And impact, as an example, an impact is their role and access level. So if someone has very little access in an organization but is very terrible at detecting malware, to keep the example going, then um, they might not be as a, as a significant uh, addition of human risk, significant factor of human risk in my organization, as someone who has high level of access and high level of user reputation. Today, much of our security work only focuses on role and access level. And while that is an important component, it only focuses on half of this equation, which is impact. The other half in, is to understand likelihood. And as we just talked about, likelihood can be mapped and tracked as a function of the security logs you already have in your environment that can use past decisions as predictors for future. So that is how we can understand and map the level of human risk that observable security action in our organization. Now, what about everything underneath the iceberg? How do we map beliefs, values, and assumptions? Um, so this area of uh, security has been studied a little bit deeper than measuring observable behavior. So I'm only going to touch about uh, on this at a pretty high level. But one of the best reports that I've found on this particular space is a combination of two sources. The first was the Corporate Executive Board did a, st uh, a study a few years ago that found that there were six main categories of reasons, uh, psychological reasons, why our employees in our workforce believed that security wasn't part of their jobs, right? They had these beliefs and assumptions that uh, uh, actually related to insecure behaviors. And um, some of them was that they, in fact, they didn't know the appropriate behaviors and policy, and so a training was appropriate. But the other five uh, were uh, much more of a surprise. So some of them were not particularly interested in security or thought it was too overwhelming. Uh, they just didn't care about security. Uh, they didn't think that a, a breach was possible or likely at an organization. They thought security, in, in, in this is perception of burden, was too hard. It was too taxing. It wasn't worth, the juice was not worth the squeeze. And finally, they thought uh, everything was already fine. Why would they, why should they go about this? And as you can see, having any one of these fundamental beliefs can and absolutely would affect how likely you're going to get people reporting, people clicking on links, people going out of their way. People like Clara choosing to delay 
a send in her organization, uh, a, sorry, a shipping of code in favor of security. And one of the best ways to measure something like this is uh, this awesome free survey uh, called the Security Force Survey. And it is uh, licensed under the Creative Commons. Uh, SurveyMonkey published a, a uh, free version of this on, off of this particular blog, but there are several versions uh, that you can access on your own. And it helps um, answer a couple of core questions related to this mindset. So how do my employees view security? Do they feel empowered to take action? Do they feel that security team prioritizes this? And doing a survey like this in your organization can help you map the mindset, uh, which is a great place to start. Uh, but as we started, as we noted at the very beginning, don't just stop at the mindset. The awareness around something and the delivering into action are two core things. So you need to be measuring both the above the iceberg and below the iceberg. So that is how we can provide visibility into this very challenging problem and the ability to understand what our level of human risk is, what are the mindset of our employees can help us understand where we need to be focusing our time and our attention, where do we need to be uh, driving change, where do we need to be making better technology investments, um, what kind of interventions we should be uh, focusing on what regions need more of, it, our, of our intention. So that's measurement. Let's flip over to the other side. We just use a lot of our right brain, now let's go to our left brain, um, which is how do we actually get people to make more thoughtful security decisions? And how do we influence the people that we work with on a regular basis to make more thoughtful security trade-offs like Clara. So let's bring up Clara again. And she, as you remember in that example, she had several reasons um, to push back on her uh, desire or her, or her interest to ship code. So part of it was bonus, deadlines, management, but fundamentally, there was a there was a couple there was something missing that prevented her from actually executing on that. Now there's actually a formula in in behavioral science that helps us understand and diagnose what's missing in an action. And so to think through uh, the study of behavioral, if we if we go into the field of behavioral science, there's the formula that you see in front of you that introduces the concept that three things need to exist at the exact same time in a moment for specific behavior to, to happen. I need to have the motivation to do that behavior. I need to have the ability to do that specific behavior or action. And I need something to remind me to do that. In the case of Clara, just to wrap that up, she may have absolutely had the ability to check the code in her organization, but she may not have had the motivation. She may not have been motivated from a bonus perspective. She may not have thought it was important. She may not thought, have thought it was part of her job. She may not have thought her boss cared about it. Um, she may not have thought that um, anyone would have noticed. So all of the reasons um, that uh, are not related to her ability fall into the motivation category. And as you can see, that's a pretty large component. Now, it's totally possible that she doesn't know um, how to do this, in which case secure coding would have been a great resource. Now, if we unpack this formula even further, we actually see that it has an inverse relationship to each other. Now, this model was done by uh, Dr. B.J. Fogg out of Stanford University. And what his model shows is that motivation and ability have inverse relationships to each other. So that the harder something is to do, the higher motivation you need to actually do it. Now, the exact opposite is true. If something's really easy to do, I don't need to particularly be motivated to do it. And so when a trigger or a prompt happens in a, and reminds me to do that action, 
if the right balance of motivation and ability exists at the exact same time, then I'll, I will do that specific behavior or that specific action. Um, and so we have two choices as security practitioners it, to be able to change people's security behavior. The first is to make something easier to do. And the second one is to increase motivation. Uh, let's take the first of that example, something that's easier to do. Uh, three uh, security actions that I've been talking about in the model of human risk is um, secure uh, password and credential management. Another one I've been talking about is reporting. And the third one is physical security. So there, um, if we take a look at secure password practices, so we would like people to have unique and secure passwords across all sites. Now the hard thing to do is to ask people to remember unique characters across all of their sites and, and try to memorize that. And uh, studies have shown that's actually very hard to do and most mere mortals cannot remember the security uh, complexity, length, and uniqueness required to actually do this at the ultimate level. So one of the ways for us to increase uh, the ability of somebody to be able to do this action is to get them to install a password manager, for example. Again, this is not necessarily training, it is giving tools and technology to change a behavior. Same thing with reporting suspicious activity. We could ask people to remember a specific URL, uh, the reporting guidelines, please forward with the, the uh, headers attached, uh, or we can just install a reporting button in our organizations and just say, just click this button when something doesn't look right. So again, we've made it easier to do. Uh, less relevant for the era in which we are all working from home, but in offices where we are trying to stop tailgating and make sure everyone's wearing physical badges, we can try to create social norms in which uh, we um, are um, f figuring out how we get people to um, hold each other accountable, or we can install physical devices uh, that allow, called man traps that actually uh, let people uh, come in and out uh, one at a time just realizing the hard and easy for the last needs to be switched. So uh, that's how we can think about making something uh, easier to do from an ability standpoint. Uh, in the case of Claire and Secure Coding, the ability for her to have um, tools and scans to check her code before it gets shipped are one ways we can, are, are, are ways we can help her with her secure coding process. Now, let's talk about motivation. Motivation is largely one of the uh, more unexplored areas in security because we often use a concept uh, force and compliance and say, if you don't do this, uh, then you'll hear from us. So uh, that's obviously not ideal. Um, and uh, we'll talk about positive and negative reinforcement, but this section will show you three motivational hacks that I've seen in my uh, experience, decade plus experience, getting people to want to do security instead of have to. So the first motivational hack that I wanted to walk you through is one called social proof. Now you've seen social proof out in the wild because it has been used by marketing and in, in, uh, and in fitness and in uh, energy consumption for years now. Now social proof uses a, um, a phenomenon in our minds of, of getting us to follow the herd. Uh, and we are constantly understanding, looking around to see if we are behaving like everyone else around us and is our actions, are our actions normal? Um, a lot of the time, this is not even conscious. And so when we see on our, uh, we see on your screen, there, uh, Amazon and online shopping sites use social proof all the time and how they use their, their reviews and say, look at all of these people, these 2,000 people who think this is a great book. Uh, you'll probably like it too. So again, signaling that this is like everybody else. 
or if you're uh, buying um, or, or booking a, a, a hotel room on, online, you can see uh, this particular example. Six people are, are looking at this moment, at this at this very moment. This this has been booked 41 times in the last 24 hours. It's in high demand. Only six rooms left. Again, signaling others. Other people think this is very good. And then the last. Is a, it has been used in the getting people to be more f efficient in their energy uses. And so uh, you may have received an energy bill that shows you how um, well you did an energy consumption the last month compared to your neighbors uh, and how much more or less efficient you were. Now, uh, this has also been done in a few places for security. Uh, George Institute of Technology and Facebook teamed up a couple of years ago to try to see if social proof worked well in getting people to turn on MFA for their accounts. And in the control group, uh, users got this notification that said, "You can use your security set. You should use security settings like MFA. It's good for you." And then the last, and and the, and then the main experimental group. Uh, showed how many of a person's friends were already using this. And so in this example, there's 108 of your friends are already using the security settings, and you should too. And they found that the social context was 1.36 times more effective at driving the adoption of MFA for those accounts than just uh, good old security best practice. Uh, We've seen uh, in our work at Elevate that comparing specific behaviors to your department, like how good you are at uh, detecting phishing attacks and not giving up your credentials, uh, has been widely successful in reducing phishing click-through rates. Uh, and in areas where people are not, not um, as good compared to their peers, following up with training and course corrective actions the uh, people are much more likely to engage with the training after the fact, after being presented with social proof showing them that they are below a specific threshold. There's also a sneaky technique in social proof called celebrity social proof that highlights whether or not you are, um, sorry, uh, a, whether uh, a famous person that you know is already doing that kind of technique. Um, you see it again with uh, famous uh, sports stars showing off a specific type of shoes, for example, or outfits or makeup. Well, the list goes on and on. But um, we, we see again in advertising, but in security, we can do something very similar. And similarly, we found that when we highlight uh, the fact that senior executives, usually someone you respect, ideally the CEO of a company, is, using, is doing a good behavior like using a particular password manager, uh, you uh, were able to drive really great and fast adoption. Um, in fact, 80% uh, 80, 80 adoption over six months just by using hi and highlighting celebrity social proof. Now the next area that I wanted to highlight is gamification. Now, gamification is all, all the rage these days, but I wanted to uh, level set on some definitions around what it is and isn't. So gamification is not about playing games at work. Uh, it is about using game mechanics, things that make gaming successful, into business environments that, so that you can drive engagement, motivation, and business results. So uh, I want to walk through a couple of examples where we've seen this in the wild. So your airline miles are an excellent uh, way of, uh, of, show, of seeing gamification being used to um, encourage loyalty to a particular airline brand. And because of that, because of our points and status and expiration, they, uh, airlines have figured out how to get us to uh, leave us certain times, fly through different airplane, air, airports, uh, all in favor of this loyalty status bonus points um, uh, reward. Uh, Fitbit and similar fitness trackers are excellent at helping us do a couple extra jumping jacks a day just to make sure we either beat our own goals or beat the goals of people we know. 
your LinkedIn profile is gamified to encourage the behavior, the action of you uh, completing your profile. And as you can see, it ties into why they're asking you to do it. It helps, it helps you with your next step, but there is a progress leaderboard that shows that you're moving all the way up to, um, uh, to completing an account. And last is loyalty to your favorite coffee club that shows buy 10, get the 11th free. Again, using reward and streaks, the concept of streaks, to, to um, encourage uh, uh, loyalty to, to the, a particular coffee brand. How about using this in security? So we've seen this uh, similarly uh, showing somebody where they are on a security strength score and giving them an idea of how well they uh, are doing as far as um, becoming a excellent security champion in the organization. If we go back to the example about how we are measuring human risk in our organizations, we can use those data sets and, and communicate using gamification how far away someone is from having excellent scores. That's the example on the left. Now, if we go all the way to the right, we can use the gamification principle of competition to compare a department's performance against each other. What I've seen this work really well is sharing, uh, picking a particular uh, security action, security behavior that you're trying to drive. Uh, again, if we could go back to the example of secure coding, how about um, scrum teams that have had uh, the bugs close within SLA most frequently or introduce no security bugs at all um, and use that particular metrics to create a leaderboard and show how each department's leader is ranking against each other so you're creating competition amongst managers. And lastly, the one in the middle is creating a streak in competition at a company-wide level or a, um, a, a, as a huge group collective. Now, as you may be familiar, the, um, in safety cultures like oil and gas they, or uh, manufacturing, they really care about the behavior of safety. And so what they do is number of days since uh, last accident or number of days since claim. And so uh, what you're doing is creating a streak that every employee is a participant of. Why not do something like this for your organizations? How about number of days since last known successful fish at our company? And it resets every time someone clicks and gives up their credentials. Um, and so this provides extra motivation for every one of our individual employees to think just one second before they click in case they reset their company clock. So those are all ways we can use the elements of gamification, so leaderboards, scorecards, uh, and competition for security. Now the last one, uh, the last area to focus on is positive reinforcement. I want to start uh, by defining positive versus negative reinforcement. Now negative reinforcement is when we strengthen a behavior uh, with the removal of a negative outcome. So I will, I put on sunscreen to avoid getting sunburn. So the behavior that I'm being reinforced is putting on sunscreen because doing that is the absence of a painful outcome. In security, this is something that we do very often. If you don't, have, if you don't click on a phishing link, you don't have to take training. That is a negative reinforcement. Uh, the example of positive reinforcement uh, is something that we see often in training of our pets or our kids when we do potty training or good behaviors or chores. When, let's say your dog does something great like go outside, uh, go to the bathroom outside, you then give them a treat. And so the dog knows this is the action that, that gives me positive reinforcement. And so in that space, the dog decides to make course corrections in their own life to get more of that good behavior. And so when we think about 
let's say the example of fishing, as I was mentioning earlier, we use the training as a really as a painful motivator um, to to stop people from clicking on training. But so many of our other behaviors are also negative reinforcement. Reset your password or we'll lock you out. Um, take your annual security training or we'll lock you out. Wear your badge or you'll get escorted to security. Uh, check your code or uh, you'll, get, um, you'll get a notice from the security team. What about using opportunities for po security for positive reinforcement? Again, back to the example of phishing, what that would look like is when an employee does a great job of detecting an attack and reporting it, replying back to the email, uh, replying to the employee and CCing their manager, letting them know that they did a great job using that particular event as an opportunity for recognition to their peers. You can use similarly, uh, similarly you, can, you can take this particular behavior and Call it out at the next all hands. Everyone who's doing a particular security action very well, use that as an opportunity to highlight great behavior in front of the entire organization. And uh, the last note on this is that while punishment can be very effective uh, in short-term gain, studies have found that positive reinforcement is just as effective at increasing the behavior you're trying to influence, but also encourages an environment of engagement and satisfaction. So with using positive reinforcement with our security messaging and the, and the security actions we want to drive, again, in reducing the human risk that we were talking about earlier, by using positive reinforcement to encourage people to, to get the, the outcomes we like, we are then also creating a culture between the security team and our employees that is built on trust and engagement. And we, are move, we move away from being the department of no to being a colleague and an ally and a trusted resource for our security team. And so in wrapping up, I want to take us back to where we started which is the idea of the, the employee being the weakest link. And for decades, we have thought um, that it is the end user's fault for being dumb and that we should be investing in so much technology to work their way around it. And we have found in the decades of doing so that it continues to be one of the areas of greatest pain in our, in our um, security stacks and the reason we often end up on headlines. And it is quite possible to have a different reality than that one. And that reality is one in which our employees make thoughtful decisions in our organization are able to detect and report suspicious attacks when they happen, are able to be thoughtful and proactive in creating secure processes, and are able to take preventative measures that leave us in a place of security resiliency instead of security vulnerability. And so, as we can see, human risk affects every part of security. There's not a, divi a, a division, a department, a section of security that doesn't have a stake in ensuring that we tackle human risk effectively. And the way we need to do this is in two parts. And first, we need to measure it. We need to understand where risk lies in our organization. And as we saw, we have a lot of the technologies in place we can understand the decisions our employees are making today and use that to understand likelihood and, and map human risk as it relates in our organizations today to create a map of where we need to be focusing our time and attention and our influence to actually change these behaviors and address this risk for, for our departments. The second half is the psychology and the influence part. Once we understand where these risks lie, 
there are tools available to us rooted in behavioral science and psychology that can help us really focus on um, the motivation and increasing the ability of our employees to uh, step up and become uh, better security champions in our organization. And if we fail to do this, we will continue to see the same headlines time and time again of vulnerabilities in our organization and even the best technology advances will continue to be thwarted by the most ingenious <laughs> of our employees. And it isn't until we think about human risk in a whole new light can we uh, tackle the weakest link and actually make it the strongest element of security. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Masha, for that deep dive into human risk. If you're interested in hearing more from Masha, she'll be holding a Q&A session right after this session. We'll be back tomorrow with two more live keynotes. Until then, don't forget to check out everything else the conference has to offer. Visit the Conference Experience tab to help navigate all the activities. And for those of you interested in joining that Q&A, click the link in the description below. If you'd like to ask a question, you can do so in the chat. If we need you to elaborate, we'll unmute you. And I apologize in advance, but only 500 people can join this Q&A. Thanks, and we'll see you tomorrow.